Hey guys, this is Nathan and it's week two of Overturned. I love this movie. And if you have not seen Aladdin yet, one of your priorities after watching this video should definitely be to go watch this movie. Watch the original first and then go watch the new one. Will Smith and Robin Williams, I can guarantee will be the best parts of both. Um, now in the movie, Aladdin, this guy right here, he stumbles upon a lamp, and in that lamp, there's a genie, the big blue guy. And that genie can make him three wishes, AKA Aladdin's wildest dreams could come true. So the first wish that he asks for is to become a prince, which is pretty cool. I'd like to be a prince too. And his second wish is for the genie to save his life when he's in some really deep trouble. So a lot goes on in the movie. He meets a beautiful princess named Jasmine. He's got a cute monkey named Abu and he defeats this evil guy named Jafar. And it all comes down to him being able to make his third and final wish. He can either become a prince again, which he had lost, have all the wealth, all the fame, all the fortune, the beautiful princess again, or he can set his genie free, who's been trapped inside of a lamp for all his life and is miserable because of it. And you're left sitting there thinking, what is he gonna choose? Now, I don't wanna spoil the movie for you. You've gotta go watch it if you haven't yet. Um, but here's the reason why I'm telling you this. I really believe that our lives aren't so different from Aladdin's. And I, in fact, I actually think that's why stories like Aladdin and other Disney movies, superhero movies, adventure movies, I think that's why they're so good and so relatable to us because our lives are so similar to them. You see, we all have multiple moments in life where we find ourselves making a decision just like Aladdin, uh, where we wonder if we're gonna choose to do the easy thing or the hard thing, which is often the right thing. And guys, we have a real enemy that would like to see us stay comfy uh, and save our own skin and do what would benefit us the most rather than experiencing what God might be calling us into, the adventure that he might be calling us into by doing the hard thing, rather than uh, fulfilling our purpose and courageously stepping into making Jesus known throughout our world. And I get it. It's so easy to ignore the opportunities he places in front of us because at first glance, they're pretty intimidating. They seem hard, they're kind of daunting. Um, and sometimes, we really do have the desire to make Jesus known, um, to do something significant and meaningful, um, something to bring some sort of change and, and, and to be bold. Uh, but we find ourselves facing problems that seem bigger than ourselves. Um, and we start to think, I'm just a fifth grader or I'm just a middle schooler. Uh, I don't know enough, no one's gonna listen to me. Um, and guys, I get it because I do that. I often think, I'm just a 24 year old, like what can I do? I don't have enough experience or wisdom to change the world. And guys, that is a lie. You have a purpose. You have been created and called by the God of the universe to make Jesus known. So keep that in mind as we jump back in to the story of Esther. Last week, we read through chapters one and two and we met these four main characters. I'm Fluxus, and I like to party. Hello, my name is Heyman. It is my goal to be number one in the whole world. My name is Mordecai, and I'm raising her. Yeah! I'm Esther, and he's raising me. So, King Xerxes only cares about partying, then you've got Hammond, who's eager and ruthless and only cares about being the biggest dog in the kennel and getting as much power and fame as he can get his hands on. Uh, and then you've got Mordecai, who's raising the main character, Esther. Um, and they are both Jews living under the rule of King Xerxes. So we left off last week with Esther becoming the new queen of Persia because King Xerxes got bored of his old queen, Vashti, and decided Esther was much more beautiful. Um, then Mordecai overheard a plot that was going to kill King Xerxes, so he tells Esther, and him and Esther stop the plot. And then the king writes it down in his big book of history. It was all exciting stuff. But meanwhile, Hammond, uh, he rises to become the most powerful official in King Xerxes' royal court. Um, his dreams of becoming number one are coming true. 
and a tiny disagreement happens between him and Mordecai, which leads to a teeny tiny confrontation, but then that leads to an evil and wicked plan. And that's where we're jumping back into the story today. So if you haven't already, I want you to press pause on this video and I want you to go read Esther's chapter three and chapter four. Um, I'll be here right when you get back. Okay, I'm glad you're back. And if you chose not to read it and just go ahead and skip ahead, I hope that you read it at some point later today because it's really good stuff. Now let's go ahead and recap what happens. The first 15 verses in chapter three look a lot like this. Everyone must bow down to me because I am Mr. Number One. Bow down to him? Yeah, right! What? <laughs> Mordecai won't bow to me? Put him to death. Uh, hey, Mr. Boss Kingman, uh, would you uh, do me a solid and uh, kill all the Jews? Uh, sure, yeah, well, whatever, man. Okay, so we see Hammond demand that everybody bend the knee for him and bow down to him. Mordecai stubbornly refuses, and then Hammond finds out that he refuses and responds like a drama queen and overreacts and demands that Mordecai be killed and the rest of the Jews just because Mordecai's a Jew. Again, it's an overreaction, but then King Xerxes just goes along with it um, and doesn't even care. Now, here's why that's such a big deal. Um, first, there's the obvious reason. King Xerxes is married to Esther, and Esther is a Jew. Now, King Xerxes thinks she's the most beautiful woman on the planet, but he doesn't know that she's a Jew. And it just went out, the decree just went out that all the Jews were gonna be killed. So that doesn't sound good for Esther. Now, here's the not so obvious that I wanna explain to you. But first, I wanna ask you, what do you know about the Jewish people? It's that they're God's chosen people. That's like probably the biggest thing that you can know about them. You see, God promised them and gave them hope that he would restore them to him through somebody coming from the line, the royal line of David. David, I said that weird. And who was David? He was a shepherd boy who uh, killed Goliath with a stone in a slingshot, pretty cool. He became king over all the Jewish people and he's a guy that we should all aspire to be like. Um, in other words, though, if Haman got his way, then God's chosen people would be massacred, which is not good. And that hope that all these Jewish people had of being restored to God would quickly fade. Um, so for Mordecai, Esther, and the rest of the Jews, hearing that they are about to be wiped out as a people group is devastating, and it seems like a hopeless situation, at least from a human point of view. In fact, in the first three verses of chapter four, we see Mordecai grieve and lament over this news, and here's actually some footage of him doing just that. Now, in the following verses, verses 4 through 11, we see that Mordecai moves on from his grief and lamenting to start looking at things outside of his limited human perspective. Um, we see that he was absolutely certain that God would not allow his chosen people to be wiped out. And he had faith that somebody, if not Esther, was going to come to the rescue. He totally trusted that God could handle this seemingly impossible and hopeless situation. So he goes to Esther and he asks her to make her identity known to Xerxes because Xerxes didn't know that she was a Jew before now. Um, and that's because Mordecai had told her not to tell him. But now he's saying, go tell Jer uh, King Xerxes that you're a Jew and beg for his favor, beg for the king's favor and plead with him on behalf of your people, the Jews. But like us, Esther finds herself in one of those moments wondering what she's gonna do. She finds herself facing a problem that feels bigger than herself. And I have no doubt in my mind that she was thinking something along the lines of, I'm just one girl. I don't even have a say uh, in what the king decides to do with his kingdom. I'm just kind of here to hang out. How can I save an entire nation of people? And what does she do? Well, she looks for reasons or excuses not to act, to stay comfy and save her own skin. <sighs> what to do, what to do? I mean, 
I'm not even allowed in the king's court unless I'm called. Just tell Uncle Morty that I can't help, but include a sad face so that he knows that I wish I could, but I can't, so yeah. But then Mordecai makes a great point in response to her reaction in verses 12 through 17. Remember what I told you to hang on to earlier? Mordecai told Esther that she has a purpose. He says that you were made queen for such a time as this. And then we see Esther courageously making a total 180, a total flip from self-preservation to resolving to seek the Lord and fulfill her purpose to save his people. If I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. What a brave thing to say. Now, I want to highlight one more thing from those last few verses for you. Notice how Mordecai points out that if Esther chose not to act, if she remained silent, then God would provide relief and deliverance for his people from somewhere or someone else. And that's a good truth to remember. God invites us to take part in the incredible world-changing things he is doing, but he doesn't need us. It is such an honor and an opportunity for him to include us in his plans, for him to look at you and say, you've got what it takes. You've got my Holy Spirit living inside of you and I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. Um, and we can either choose to do the easy thing or we can choose to do his thing. But either way, know that he's gonna do great things. Um, and I also wanna point out that Esther knew what was right. You know, like she totally knew what was right, but she knew it would cost her something. Um, it could potentially cost her her life is what she's thinking. And let's go back to Aladdin too. Um, in Aladdin, he knows what's right. He knows that setting the genie free is the right thing to do, but he knows that it's gonna cost him the chance to be a prince again, to have wealth again, to have a beautiful princess again. Um, and I wanna tell you that living within your purpose, guys, doing the hard thing uh, and the right thing is likely going to cost you something. It's going to definitely cost you your comfort. But choosing to fulfill your purpose and experiencing what you were made for is totally, totally worth it. Um, but how do you get started? You're probably wondering, what in the world do I do with this story? How do I apply this to my relationship with Jesus? Well, stick with us because my friend is about to hop on and give you some real practical ways to do just that. Hey guys, we think that everything in this video that you've seen and heard so far is so important and we want to give you practical ways to take these truths and make them an active part of your life in a way that really makes a difference. And so we have three questions that we would love for you just to think through and answer for yourself. The first of these that we would love for you to ask yourself is what are you currently bowing down to in the world's kingdom that doesn't honor God? What are your idols currently? Is it a simple habit? Is it people pleasing? The way you're using your time? We would love for you just to consider and think through that. And then the second question is where does your focus go when times get hard? How do you react and respond? Do you lash out in frustration to people around you? Do you distract yourself and numb out or cope in some other way? Or do you turn to the Lord and ask him who he would want you to be in that situation and what he would have you do to honor him? And then the third question is, how are you using your circles of influence for God's kingdom? So the people that you interact with on a regular basis, how are you showing them God's love? And how are you making Jesus known to them, whether they have a relationship with Christ or not? And then you're probably wondering what you can do instead of just asking yourself questions. And so I have a challenge for you. The story of Esther is not actually about Esther. It's actually about God and who he is and what he's doing. And so let's also take a moment to take the focus off of ourselves. And so think about something you do during the day to serve yourself. And then one day this week, we challenge you to overturn that mindset and use that time to instead serve somebody else in order to show them the love of Christ. And then we wanna leave you with this last and final challenge. We have to know God's voice in order to hear what he's trying to tell us and the opportunities that he has for us, just like the opportunities he had for Esther. And so we challenge you to set a goal this week 
to get to know him every single day by spending time with him in prayer and in his word to really start learning how to recognize his voice when he speaks to us. And so if you're wondering how to do that, we have an Esther reading plan that we are posting on social media that we can send to you. Feel free to ask for that and search for it. And we would love for you to read along with us as we study Esther these next couple of weeks. And then if you have any other questions, ask us. We are here for you and we want to follow Christ with you. I hope Brittany was able to give you some practical ways that you can make this story come alive in your own life. Now, I want to leave you with this last thing. Um, remember how I said earlier that God had promised he would restore his people to himself um, by a king from the royal line of David? Well, I don't want to spoil this story for you, but God ultimately does that when Jesus is born. Jesus, a man from the royal line of David, fully man and fully God, um, who came down to earth to usher in the kingdom of heaven and restore all of God's people to a right relationship with him. Um, and how did he do that, you might be asking? Well, he lived a perfect and sinless life and then died for our broken and sinful ones, um, only to be raised from the dead three days later and show us that through his death and his resurrection, he has put our sin to death and we have the opportunity to live forever in freedom with him. Um, life forever, guys. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Um, and if you believe that, if you are in Christ, you now have Christ's Holy Spirit living on inside of you. Um, now it is Christ within you. Um, and it's because of Christ within you that you can fulfill your purpose and experience what you were made for, to know Jesus, to know God, and to make him known. Um, there is no other way to fulfill your purpose and experience what you were made for aside from Christ. Um, now, you don't need me to tell you that there are so many opportunities uh, to share the love of Christ right now, to make Jesus known to the world right now, uh, to give people a glimpse of what his everlasting kingdom looks like, as opposed to the worldly kingdom that we're all living in that seems to fail every other day. And by the way, nothing in this worldly kingdom surprises God. Coronavirus didn't surprise God. Uh, the hurt, the pain, and the injustice that we are all experiencing right now doesn't surprise God. He's in control of all of it, just like he was in the story of Esther. And he's inviting you to step into it. You see, God has the power to overturn hearts, uh, to overturn pain, and to overturn fear. Um, just like God overturned the heart of Esther from one of self-preservation and fear to one of boldness and selflessness, he can overturn anything um, for his glory and for our joy. Um, and like Esther, trust where the Lord has brought you. Uh, trust that you are experiencing what you are for a reason. It's what you were made for. You were made for such a time as this. Now go make Jesus known. I was made for this. 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 I was made for this.